I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Our first selection will be Sing to Me of Heaven. <clears throat> Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. time West Brother Doug Massfield if he'll come and have her opening prayer. <clears throat> Let us all bow. Lord we thank you 
for this first day of the week that we're told to assemble together, Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth and exalt your precious name. And pray our service this morning, Father, has been pleasing to you. Father, aware of around us, around us, around us, the flood has affected so many areas around us and lives have been lost and further causes, Father, will, will be in those regions also. And we pray, Father, that you be with those that you would encourage him, Father, through the word and that things happen to us that we have no control over. And Father, for the lives that have been lost, we pray for the families that there would be institution, Father, for them to come together to in prayer and meet together, Father, and share their experiences with their lives as those that have been lost. Father, we ask you to be with those who are traveling the roads today that each one may have a safe trip to their destination. Father, thank you for the church here that we attend, and so thankful, Father, for the elders, the decisions that they make, Father. We pray that they come to you for advice and they know what to say and what to do to help others, Father, in need. Father, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace, and thank you, Father, for giving us your Son to die on earth, here on this earth, Father, for the sins of the world. And Father, thank you for the sovereignty that we have here, and we ask you, to Father, to be with those in Ukraine, between Russia and Father, this will be settled, and they will be able to build their homes and places back once again. Father, thank you for being able to come to you with outside intervention source of any kind. And Lord, as we walk down the narrow pathway, we know that one day that life will be no more, and we pray, God, that we could have on with you in heaven on Judgment Day these things we ask and pray through Christ our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> our God, he is alive. There is
Thank you for being here this evening. Appreciate your presence here. And if you join us online, we certainly appreciate your presence as well. I have to admit that I'm a little shaky. My legs are weak. My arms feel a little weak. It's not because I'm standing before you. I got a call about 20 minutes after five this afternoon from my next door neighbor and she says, Eddie, we've got some things ready to go to Campton if you will take them over to your church, she said. I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be there to get them. So I go over and the first thing that I had to load was uh, three cases of 40 bottles a piece of water. That's 16 bottles over my limit. And there was three of them, along with some other things. But I was happy to do so. And if you see my truck sitting out in the parking lot, it's kind of out in the way. I didn't have time to unload and park properly before I came in and, and to share the, with the boys the, uh, the PowerPoint that I have this evening. Attitudes in action. The storytelling of Jesus, what we call the parables, for the most part are designed that we, as a reader, that we as a reader examine our attitudes, that we examine our ethics, that we examine our view of the world, that we examine how we treat people. And with the ideal of getting all that right, of getting all that right, Jesus gives us parables. I want you tonight, tonight, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Now, two weeks ago, you remember that Brother Doug Trent had a lesson and the uh, first words out of his mouth up here was, turn to Luke chapter 10. And you don't know how close I came to jumping up and saying, time out, Doug. I'm working on a lesson in chapter 10 already. Please don't mess that up. Well, he must have. Uh, Heard what I was thinking or whatever, because he went to the last few verses in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to go above that to the story of the, of the Good Samaritan this evening. And we're going to use this parable to look at attitudes. Now, you've, I know you've heard a lot of lessons concerning the Good Samaritan, and you're probably thinking, oh, no. We're going to go through the elevation of Jericho and Jerusalem and, and all these things, all these people involved. And so well, I'm going to look at it a little, from a little different perspective. We're going to look at it from a, a, just a little bit different angle. We're going to look at the, our, our attitudes of, of gratitude and of kindness and of humility. And we're going to try to find out what, what does this really look like? What do these attitudes look like in our life? Do people in your life and in mine, do, we, do they see the, the fruits of these attitudes that we have? That of gratitude and kindness and, and humility? Or do we perhaps need an attitude adjustment every once in a while as we tell our teenage kids? We're not going to use these words anymore. You won't see them again. What I want to do is to work these words into the parable of the Good Samaritan and see how all these play out. We're going to look, beginning in chapter 10, verse 25. Read along with me, if you please. I'm in the ESV version. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit? To inherit eternal life. Now we can stop right there and have several, several lessons. I don't know, perhaps we could fix a quarter, Jerry, of how do I inter inherit eternal life? There's a lot involved, but that's, that was the question. This is not the first time that, that this question has been asked by this lawyer. Now he was not a Perry Mason, he was not a Ben Matlock. Remember this is under the old law, he was a teacher of the law, etc., so he's, uh, he's asking uh, Jesus Christ this question. And, and Jesus, he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, 
and your neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. So, now we get into, we get into the parable. I'm going to leave the lawyer alone. We're not, going to, we're not going to look at him this evening. But what about, a, what about our neighbor? It's not, just, you know, it's not just someone next door, and you, you've heard this before. It's not someone that's just like us. It's not someone that, uh, who does something for you, and you feel like, well, I need to be a good neighbor and do that in return. You know, you borrow a cup of sugar, they bring you back two cups of sugar or whatever in return. You know, we're not talking about that kind of neighbor, of course, as far as that goes. You see, in this story here, no one knows anyone else. The people involved here are basically strangers, as far as we know. No one knows anyone else. And I submit to you this evening that there are three different kinds of people, three classes of people, however you want to classify, three groups of people that are represented in this parable here that we want to look at. There's three attitudes in action. We're not looking at the lawyer. We're not looking at the victim this evening. So we want to examine. And I like to do lessons that kind of are self-examinations where we kind of look at ourselves as we go through and see just how am I measuring up to what's in God's Word? Just how well am I doing in that area that's been taught by Jesus or whatever the case may be, whatever lesson might, might concern itself with. So tonight, I ask you to kind of examine yourself as we go through this. The first of the three that we want to look at is in verse 30. And often these people don't get a lot of attention when we study this parable. But look in verse 30. So Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem. This is an answer of who is my neighbor. He's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Robbers. They're still around today, are they not? That's why we basically have locks on our doors, locks on our cars, and, and so forth and so on. And these robbers can best be described as, as takers. Especially in our story this evening, in our parable that we're looking at this evening. They can be best described as takers. They have the mindset that everything is subject to me. You have it, I want it, I'll take it. That's what these robbers did. Now, this was supposedly a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. There were a lot of places that robbers could hide out and, and ambush people as they came by and so forth and so on. But we don't know if this is the first person they encountered that night or whenever the time was or if it was the second or the third. We don't know. But there are robbers. And they have the attitude or the mindset that What's yours is mine. What's yours is mine, and I'll do anything to get it. I'll do anything to get it from you. Everything that belongs to you is mine, and when they go to get it, they really don't care who they hurt. They'll take it. You've seen on the news of people who've been robbed before, of how one human being has beaten sometimes another human being beyond recognition. I don't know about you, but I can't fathom doing that to another human being, especially being a Christian. How would you ever do that to someone? But they don't care who they hurt, they have no compassion, they have no feelings. They simply want what is yours, and they don't care who they hurt. And they can describe, you can describe their ethics basically in one word. It's all about self. It's all about me. I want it, you have it, and I'm going to take it from you. I'm a taker. I'm a taker. It's all about self. But there are some other characters in our story this evening that we're looking at that I want to draw your attention to
But first, before we do that, let me ask you this. You think we have takers in the church? Someone that would do something? Do we have robbers in the... Well, no, I don't think we really have robbers in the church, do we? But, uh, you know, there's some, there's some other problems that people cause when it comes to the Lord's church. If you want to, turn over to Galatians. I'm in chapter, chapter 5. I'm in verse 13. Let's look at this just for a moment before we move on to our next group. Paul says, therefore, you were called to freedom, brothers. Notice this audience here. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through one serve one another. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Here it is again. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Now, right there, it indicates to me that there are some takers. They won't exactly rob you of anything, but they'll try to take your dignity. They'll try to take your confidence in the Lord away from you. They'll try to cause problems. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Excuse me, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things you want to do. Now, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh, and here's where it becomes evident that we have some takers, perhaps when Paul was writing this letter, that were causing problems. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Let me stop right there. Have you ever heard of churches of the Lord splitting? Sometimes because... There were takers. They were having issues of the flesh from their past. They could not press on to the prize, could not press on to the goal. They digressed in their Christianity. And they were jealous. They had all kinds of issues. Perhaps it was that way in their previous life, probably was. It was in their DNA. They brought that with them in the church. And they could not get rid of that baggage and cause problems. But let's move on to the second kind of people. The second kind of people. Verse 31 and 32, back in Luke chapter 10. Verses 31 and 32. And we're kind of going to group these together. It says, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, now kind of note when he saw him, or he saw him, okay, we'll bring that up just a little bit later in our lesson. He passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now remember, we're under the old law here. Jesus is sharing this parable, this story with us. So we're, he's talking about priests and Levites. Now we're not going to go into all the, the uh, industries, shall we say, of the, of the priests. We're just not going to go into that in detail. All priests were basically Levites, but all, not all Levites were, were priests. They had different roles. Priests had duties and responsibilities, of course, concerning the temple. And Levites, in a broader term, they were kind of a support system, support team, if you will, for, for priests. Now remember, this man that got robbed, he was coming from Jerusalem, going to Jericho. Now some commentators say that Jericho was the home of a lot of priests. And they traveled this road quite frequently, going to Jerusalem to serve in the temple and then going back home to Jericho. So, could we say that these were good people? 
Could we say they were godly people? Well, you would certainly think so. But in our story, we have to consider them keepers. They're not bad people. They're not takers. They don't belong in that group. But they just don't help when the opportunity arises. They have the mindset of, well, what's mine is mine. And when we get into this group, looking at this group, we've got to start to be very careful that some of this doesn't apply to us. What is mine is mine. They have that kind of attitude. They have that mindset. Remember when I told you when he saw or he saw? At that particular point in time, there was a decision that had to be made. Am I going to help? Or am I not going to help? We knew, know what these two did. They looked, decided, nope, I'm not going to get involved. They recognized the situation. There's someone in dire need, but, well, they're going to keep what they've got. Their time, their compassion, their emotion, whatever is involved, they're going to keep that. What is mine is mine. We don't know, but... You know, maybe the priest might have justified their position that they took. You know, uh, maybe they could, you know, what? this man should have never come this way. What, does he know the reputation of the robbers and this road that there's always someone getting robbed and getting hurt? You know, it's really his own fault. So that being the case, I'm, not, I'm just not going to help. I'm going to remain neutral, and I'm going to be on my way. You know, he made a bad decision. He made a bad decision. He shouldn't have left Jerusalem at that time of day, going to Jericho. That was a bad decision. On, you know, it's his fault. It's just his fault. He did that. They're clearing their conscience, you see, because they're keepers. They keep what is theirs. They keep what, are, what is theirs. You, you know, the keepers, they, they just don't care who they help. They just don't have that attitude about them, that, that humility, the emotion involved, etc., etc. That's not there. Sometimes we might describe it as, well, he or she has a cold heart. You know, no feeling for others, that kind of thing. But that's the keepers. They don't care who they hurt and so forth. You know, maybe the, maybe the priest and the Levite, maybe they said, you know, I can't help this man right now, but when I get back to Jericho, I'm going to get some of my fellow priests and maybe some Levites together, and we're going to have a prayer session for him. That's what we'll do. And then they'll feel better about themselves because they prayed for the situation. You know, prayer is a powerful tool. We, we use it all the time, do we not? I hope you do. Prayer is a powerful tool in a Christian's arsenal that we need to use. That we need to use. But sometimes there's a demand for action. Let me interject something right here. When it comes to being a good neighbor, when it comes to helping someone, not particularly about the man on the side of the road, but in our society, there's three things usually that's involved. There's usually emotion. There's usually energy or effort. And then sometimes there can be expense. Sometimes it can be one. Sometimes it can be two. Sometimes it can be all three. But emotion and energy and expense. Perhaps the Levites thought, well, if I stop and I do help this man, it's probably going to cost me. I'm going to have to invest in his problem. 
And right now, I just don't have the time to do that. So they go on. They go on. And sometimes it's not just about money. Sometimes people need help, not in a financial way. Sometimes it's an ear for them to listen or for us to listen. Sometimes it's just sharing a problem in their life. It may be an illness. And they may want to confide in you. They may want, to, want you to pray for them. And of course, that's what we should do. When the opportunity comes, folks, we need to weigh that opportunity carefully. And we need to make sure that, well, that we don't have this keeper attitude that, again, it's all about self. It's all about me. There's a good illustration. It's found in Mark chapter 10. The rich young ruler. You remember the story. I'm not going to read it. We're not going to turn there. But you know, basically, he, he said, you know, what, what do I need to in inherit eternal life? Well, how about the law? He said, I've, I've done all that, Jesus. And Jesus loved him, told him, you need to sell your possessions. That's a roadblock prime example of a keeper what is mine is mine remember he went away sorrowfully Matthew chapter 6 Sermon on the Mount verse 19 very familiar with uh, you're very familiar with this with this uh, particular passage Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, you might say, how do I do that? How do I take the treasures here on earth, my treasures here on earth, and how do I move them up there in heaven? You remember the man on the side of the road? That's how you do it. That's how you do it. When people in your life come into your life needing emotion, energy, expense, you're there to help them. You don't have the what's mine is mine attitude. You're willing to go the extra mile. Well, let's move on here. Let's look at the givers. And I hope uh, this is where we all are. This is where we certainly belong. And I hope, hope that that's where we certainly are tonight. I feel like Rolling Hills as a congregation. I believe we fit in this category quite well. Quite well. Verse 33. But, this, but a Samaritan, and we're not going to go into all the problems with Samaritans and Jews and so forth, but, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, journey, came to where he was, notice this, and when he saw him, oh, time for decision. He's got a situation. There's somebody in need. When he saw him, notice what he did. First thing. He invested emotion. Jesus said he had compassion. He had compassion. It's not always easy to have compassion on some people, is it? I'll raise my hand and say I'm guilty. You won't have to raise yours. You can just answer yourself. But, uh, you know, a lot of the times we're going down the road and you see this healthy young man you know, he's twice my size, and, and uh, he's looking for a donation. 
You know what I'm guilty of? There is help needed on every sign you go down the road about every business, every, every man. They're needing help. And this healthy young man is looking for a handout. And we move on. Was he the man on the side of the road that needed compassion? We pass it by, we pass him by, and we usually don't give it another thought. We don't stop to investigate what's going on in this young man's life. What has led him to be there in that situation that he needs that kind of help? We don't stop and ask. We simply go on. Compassion. Sometimes we have to invest that first to find out if there's another investment investment needed to help someone in their situation then look what he did he had compassion verse 34 he went to him and bound up his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an end and took care of him there's the energy there's the effort he not only stopped recognized the situation had compassion had feeling felt compelled to do something, he invests his time, his effort, his energy to help the man on the side of the road. Sometimes we need to do that. We go on. And the next day, he took out two denarii. That's two days' wages. I don't work anymore, so I don't know how much that is that I make. You probably do if you work every day. You know how much your two days' wages are. He says he took that, and he took it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He's basically, in our time, he's left his credit card with the innkeeper and say, You know, just charge it to my credit card, and I'll take care of it. There's the expense. What's mine is mine. It doesn't fit here. It doesn't fit here. You see, because when we talk about givers, it's what's mine is yours attitude. That's the mindset. God has blessed me to do what? To lay up my treasures in, on the earth? That's not how you inherit eternal life, Jesus says. You need to lay up treasures in heaven. By investing in motion, energy, and expense in your neighbor, in the situation, whatever that may be. Whatever that may be. What's mine is yours. They don't care about the cost. Keepers don't care about the cost. We as a congregation help several people from time to time. That means you're helping people from time to time as well. Oftentimes, we simply do not hand people a $100 bill and say, God bless you and go on your way. We try to be very diligent. We try to investigate. Because of the circumstances that we live in in our world today, you know what they are. You'll probably get a phone call tomorrow trying to take some of your funds from the takers. So we try to be very diligent, very wise about what we do and who we help. But I can guarantee you that practically 99% of the time we help. You say, well... Don't know if they really need that or not. You know, well, we don't know. Christ said, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. Remember that? So that's a good investment on our part. That's a good investment on our part. That's the difference between 
takers and keepers and givers. They don't care what it costs. Let's talk just a moment about the greatest act of giving that's ever been known. Jesus Christ himself. You see, once upon a time, you were the man on the side of the road. Jesus came down that road. He made an investment in you and in me. Emotion, compassion, love. Energy, oh my, look what he did for us. All the things he's taught us in his word. The examples on how to live. All these things he's done for us. Expense. What more could you give? What more could you give than your life? Let's take the takers out of the picture. I don't think that applies to any of us here tonight. Let's kind of put the keepers in the background. Let's try to keep them back there. And let's really concentrate right there. About being givers. Recognizing. The ultimate example of giving. Jesus Christ on the cross for you and I. Laying up our treasures in heaven. By being a good neighbor. That's how you inherit eternal life. That's my goal. It's your goal. Certainly we'd like to help you attain your goal tonight. If that be the case. We ask you to make that known as we stand and as we sing.
If you wish to partake of the Lord's Supper this evening and do not have a communion kit, raise your hand and one will be made available to you. This is a time that we set aside in our service to serve the Lord's Supper to those who have not had an opportunity to partake today. Those of you online uh, may partake with us also at this time. And in preparing our minds for this uh, important feast, remembering the Lord's death, we'll be reading Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 22. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Would you pray with me as we thank God for the bread? Father, we thank you that Jesus came and died for us, and we pray that you bless this bread as those uh, per, as they partake of it, that it uh, be done in a manner pleasing in your sight. We thank you for the suffering Savior and for what it has meant to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we continue our prayer thanking you for the fruit of the vine that represents his blood, that was shed without which we could have no remission of our sins. Be with all who partake, and may it be done in a well-pleasing manner. Please bless this fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name, amen. Another part of our worship service is giving back to the Lord a portion of that with which he has blessed us. <clears throat> in Acts, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians about the giving of the Macedonian churches. And he says, Moreover, brethren, we make it known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. In great trial of affliction, the, in the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, they abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. The key to giving the way God expects us to give is first give ourselves to the Lord, then giving of our means and uh, a proper amount and a, a goodly amount is not difficult when we have given ourselves to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, you have blessed us so greatly. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you've given us. We thank you for allowing us to live the way we do. Please be with the hearts of everyone that is giving back to you at this point. We pray that uh, they will give with a cheerful heart and certainly first give ourselves to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd like to remind you that there are announcement sheets in the back of the auditorium. If you'd not get one this morning or pick one up on your way in this evening, you can certainly pick one up. I did have a few names that were added or given to us today that are not on the list. Uh, this morning, I was told that Charles Wills was not feeling well, and I don't see him here this evening either. So let's keep Charles in our prayers. Kenny Joe Neese's name was given to me, and uh, he was 
if I remember this correctly, he was injured following the flooding that was taking place there. And he was cut and had to have a number of stitches and then became septic. So he's very ill in the midst of all of the damage that was done to his property and uh, certainly is dealing with uh, uh, a number of health issues now there in that Jackson area. Um, also, Lillian Starks, his son Jay Bush, uh, passed away last week. And then following that, his uh, house was washed away as well. So that family is certainly enduring a lot in both the loss of, of Jay and the loss of that household as well. Um, we had a number of individuals when we were talking about giving, uh, a number of individuals I know that, that gave money, and I know there's materials that were in the back as well for the flood victims that uh, are going to be distributed uh, through Campton, and I believe there's some conversation maybe about down at Jackson, maybe some doing some work down there to try to help that congregation as well upcoming. So if you would like to donate either cleaning supplies, there's a list of items here on uh, the announcement sheet, or if you would find it easier just to donate money to where they can get what they need there for uh, those supplies. You can certainly give that to the elders or give it to Danny uh, this evening, or if you would like to continue doing that this upcoming week, I'm sure there's going to be needs ongoing there. Uh, church family game night will be coming up Friday evening uh, over at Canaan. If you want to participate, uh, that is going on at 6 o'clock Friday. Visitation group 1 meets next Sunday evening following evening services. Uh, two weeks from yesterday at 4 o'clock, we have uh, the Youth Life Program. It's an informational meeting at 4 o'clock here. There's a meal following. That program is aimed at middle school, high school, college-age students to help them develop discipleship, to help them grow their faith. Um, there seems to be some confusion on based on some of the questions that I've been, been asked as though it's almost like a, a very short term. This is a year-round program is how we envision this, to help young people uh, develop their faith. So it's a question. Uh, we'll, they'll be prevent, presenting information, also have questions and answers going on. So if you would like to participate and be here, it doesn't matter if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you are the, the uh, child that's interested in it, that's great. Any member here is welcome to come to that. Uh, is also going to be, our, our plan is to also broadcast that online to where you can also follow that or other congregations can follow along as well and text in any questions they may have so we can actually try to answer those as it's being done. So if you would like to come to that and stay for the uh, meal following, sign up for the meal part. You don't have to sign up for anything else. Just, just attend or, or participate. Cane Ridge Lectureships upcoming this week beginning August the 4th through the 7th. Um, also, if you're out getting groceries and you'd like to participate in the blessing box by picking up a couple of items or such, you can certainly do that. There's also a sign-up sheet for Secret Pal out on the bulletin board as well. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Eddie, for your lessons that you presented. Thank you for all of our teachers who have presented lessons in the classrooms uh, as well as in, in here today. Thank you very much for your preparation. Jerry, thank you for leading us in the communion focus and our men, which have led us in song and in prayer as well. Thank you very much for your, for your help. Is there any other announcements that we need to make before we're dismissed? Joe? Okay. Okay. Kids are going to be filling up the blessing box again, so there's food out here. If they want to gather with Joe, they'll be filling that box back up this evening. Anything else? Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity for us to worship. Father, we just pray that it was pleasing to you. You're worthy of our praise and adoration. Father, just help us that we may live in such a way that you're pleased with us. Help us to be good stewards, to realize that the blessings that you've given us, the time that you've given us, and whatever skills and abilities that we use them wisely within your kingdom. Father, we know that you loved us by the sacrifice of Jesus. Help us to never take that for granted and to realize how dear that needs to be to each of us. Father, just be with us as we depart from here. Help us to do our best to grow our Christian disciplines. Help us to grow in our faith and our reading, our study, our prayer. Just be with us as we depart from here. May we be safe. Help us to be a good influence on those around us as we incur them, whether it's at work or at home or in our neighborhoods. 
so that others may see Christ living in us. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.